Welcome to another adventure. Before the video starts, remember to leave a like and subscribe. Now, enjoy the video. And follow me on Twitch. Today, we are gonna watch SCP-4000 Taboo. Uh, not really sure what it's about. It's been widely recommended, so I think this is, is gonna be a good one. Because we had to watch The Factory before we watched this one. I'm not really sure why, but uh, maybe we'll find out. Uh, so this should be very interesting. SCP-4000. Taboo. What is a name? For humans, names are used to identify and refer to a specific entity, whether it be a family member, a country, a beloved pet, or a creepy guy in your neighborhood that lives under a bridge. Names have meaning to us, certainly, but they're completely fluid within our society. Names can be changed, unofficially or officially, Nicknames come and go, and new names for people and things are invented every day. In many parts of folklore and religion, knowing an entity's true name allows some control or power over them. And this concept oh. is often utilized in fictional stories. Yeah, like the conjuring. I'm like... telling you this because SCP-4000 is primarily about the power of names and words. And although we often say that words have power, SCP-4000 puts quite a different spin on it. Mm. Before we get into SCP-4000, however, I have to first discuss another SCP article, for those unfamiliar with it. And that's one of the SCP-001 proposals. Oh, the fact Although it's really more of a story than a proposal. Yeah, that's The story is told by one of the O5s, the highest ranking individuals in the SCP Foundation and discusses a factory, first built in 1835. The factory was massive, a mile across at its widest, and was built to produce practically anything, while also housing all of its employees inside of it. The factory was built by a wealthy industrialist, James Anderson, who dabbled in certain dark arts, and who cared very little for the safety and health of his employees. People were born, worked, and died without ever leaving the factory, and the conditions were nightmarish, but it continually pumped out satisfactory products for decades. Eventually, someone escaped, and the president was informed of the situation there, causing him to send in the military. They found unimaginable horrors taking place there, both mundane and anomalous, as apparently Anderson was experimenting on people and they eventually found Anderson in his office. They hung him with his own entrails and proceeded to draw and quarter him, followed by burning the remains, with him laughing and uttering blasphemies the entire time. They found a number of anomalous objects within the factory, and the SCP Foundation, as well as a number of other organizations, got their start right there. A decade went by, with the founding members of the Foundation building a city around the factory, and using it as their first site for containment and testing. Eventually, however, they were attacked by an entire race of anomalous creatures, sharing practically the same appearance as humans, but with a notable allergy to iron. A war occurred between the two sides, culminating in a grand attack on the factory that the humans were quickly losing. The O5 went into the bowels of the factory and met the remains of James Anderson who made a deal with him. In exchange for the means of destroying these creatures, they would have to continually supply the factory with energy, primarily in the form of people. The O5 agreed, the creatures were utterly wiped out, and the factory continues to somehow produce new anomalies to this day. As a side mm. note, the name the Foundation used for the creatures, due to their allergy to iron, was fairies. Now that I've mentioned all that, we can look into SCP-4000. Just a quick note, yeah, that's the one, that's the previous video that we made, uh, so if you haven't checked that out, I would highly recommend that. But yes, we got a deep look into the factory, the SCP. I will also note something that I thought was a little bit cool. Uh, apparently, somebody commented on the last video we did on the factory, and they mentioned that fairy in Latin, I believe, means iron, 
which gives a little bit of an uh, origin of the name and why they can, uh, why they are allergic to iron. I know, a little bit nerdy, but I thought it was cool nonetheless. So we know the story of the factory very well, I think. And so I think we are quite equipped to keep going. Put it simply, SCP-4000 is a forest, albeit one located outside of our normal space and time. Ooh. There are plants and landmarks and entities within this forest, but most importantly, it's a forest governed by certain rules. These rules are known as nomenclative hazards, meaning they are hazards specifically triggered by names. There are other rules, of course, for safe traversal of the forest, but names hold a special power here. Ooh. The special containment procedures warn that the forest itself as well as any entity or landmark within, is not to be referred to by any title, designation, or name. I've already broken these rules several times, of course, by referring to it as SCP-4000, a designation not found anywhere within the document. Instead of names or designations, then, the anomalies associated with this SCP are given descriptions, such as the forest outside normative space, or the SCP in question. Additionally, none of these descriptions can be repeated, forcing someone discussing the SCP or its contents to continually utilize new language when talking or writing about it. Oh! If someone breaks these rules, they must immediately perform a recontainment protocol. If they are unable to do so, their next of kin must perform the procedure. And if they have no next of kin, any records of their name are removed, and anyone bearing the same name are given an amnestic and assigned a new name. I guess that it's because the reason why you have to continuously change the definition of it is because if you call it the forest beyond, right? If you use it too many times, it becomes the name, so to speak, right? If you, if you refer to the same thing twice with the same words, that designates the name by the definition of the SCP. That's a terrible fate, though. Imagine losing everything you have, including, like, your name, memories, everything that was ever about you just wiped off the earth. I might be wrong about this, but is this a info hazard or not? Because it's like, well, it's not that the information itself, though, right? It's more like referring to the information with a certain name. So I don't know if that is classified as an info hazard or not. Yeah, I have no idea, honestly. They say that names have a uh, have power, but what what what's the consequences of using those names? I'm thinking about like the entities inside there, right? What if you say Mr. Beer, right, is inside there, and you meet him and you like and you know his name is Adam, and you're like, hi, Adam. What happens then? You know. To enter the forest, a special procedure must be performed, in which a fire is started in any indoor fireplace and the powdered bones of a fox, a lion, and a whale are thrown into it, along with a cherished personal possession. Then, three feathers from a raven or similar bird are held above the fire until they float up the flue, and at this point, the fire should begin to speak. Depending on if the what? individual is an oldest child, a middle child, or the youngest or only child, Certain counterphrases must be given in response to the fire. If done incorrectly, the individual should immediately apologize and never attempt the procedure again. But if done correctly, the fireplace will expand and a descending ladder will appear, allowing the person to pass through the fire unharmed and enter the forest. Ooh. They will emerge from a brick well with a dirt road in front of them surrounded by the forest. Wait, just just a note. I, I didn't catch this. Was this a procedure that you do to enter the forest? Or was this uh, as a response if you, you fucked up and you called it forest multiple times? The forest, the forest, right? Kind of gave it a name. I don't remember, fuck. Attempting to leave the dirt road or turning back the way you came leads to a loss of contact and an unknown fate. Forcing individuals entering the forest to continue along the path until they reach the end, which is the brick well. Spending time in the forest will inevitably lead to encounters with the entities dwelling there, which will often lead to the nomenclature of rules being broken. Ooh. So what exactly happens when you break these rules? 
Ah, oh, here it comes. The results vary, and there's likely effects still undocumented, as SCP-4000 is not greatly understood at this point, and the Foundation is heavily restricting any experimentation. Effects include cluster headaches, hallucinations, sudden onset of amnesia, transport of exposed subjects to the forest, or alternatively, transport of forest entities to where the rules were broken. Oh god. Even more strange, exposed subjects might develop non-human physical characteristics, such as growing feathers or pollen sacs. Different types of flowers might grow wherever the rules were broken, or exposed subjects might completely fuse with a native entity. Perhaps most strange of all, different non-biological mediums, where names or designations were written or recorded, such as paper or a desk, might develop biological traits. Along with fusions between native entities and architectural spaces near where the rules Ooh. were broken. Okay. Finally, exposed subjects might develop an extreme iron deficiency, with no side effects. Hmm. We're also given a few notable containment breaches, showing the forest was first discovered in 1954 in rural Connecticut, and was temporarily given a designation. I do wonder then, do you think that there's any SCPs in the present that came from this place? I'm thinking, honestly, I'm thinking like SCP-096, like, that's that uh, Windigo looking SCP. Long arms, lanky, if you look at it, he fucks you up. Because this looks like a, a place where such a creature could have co come from. There's probably a bunch of other creatures that I don't know of that also sound and probably has some uh, possibility in belonging to this place. So if you use like words like the desk or the stone or the tree, those things can actually come to life. Not live, like move around with limbs and shit, but like they can, they get properties that they originally didn't have. So it's kind of like, dude, you know what it's like? I feel it's a little bit like, okay, imagine a Harry Potter on steroids, dude. Like you have like your wand and you're like Expelliarmus, right? And all that shit. But here it's like every word you say that has a name in it changes something in some manner following i would guess following some natural rule you know if you say the desk and it the desk fucking starts growing a tail or you see the tree and it starts getting a face right it's it's probably not the same but it probably has some logic in it of course we don't know the logic but it most definitely have to some degree i would guess but yeah i would look upon this nearly as like Harry Potter's on steroids, like, you don't need a wand, and you don't know what you're doing, but you say a name, oh, Mr. Anderson, and there, boom, a like, a creature appears in front of you that's, like, gonna rip your head off. I have a little bit of a, a thought experiment, then. Uh, let's say we send in two D-class members, number one and number two, just to keep it simple. Number one refers to number two with a name. How will that affect number two or will it only affect number one? I would presume it would affect both people in a sense, but I'm not sure, does it affect the, the, the person who said it as well? Because it was something about like, you know, if, if the first person said a name, things happened, but it didn't say that things happened to him directly, did it? Oh no, never mind. It was like amnesia, hallucinations, and uh, headaches and stuff like that. So true, true. So there is actually consequences no matter what, how you look upon it. So they can actually make SCP by going in, referring to the name and bringing them back. I guess the hard part is to bring them back, of course. Which caused a breach, since no designations can be applied to the forest. One field agent entered the forest, never to be seen again, and another that had given the designation began sinking into the floor. The other agents fled, and all but one suddenly stopped and began screaming as their torsos start to stretch and smoke begins to billow out of their mouths, nose, and eyes. The That's one grim. agent that gets away does so because he had not heard the designation given to the forest, but he himself causes another breach when repeatedly referring to it with the same word. He then says that he sees his name in the trees, attempts to eat his radio, and dies. 
Those that had Sorry. heard his radio call <laughs> began he to have to headaches his radio? before bone okay. protrusions resembling tree branches begin to emerge from their eye sockets, oh. although they report no physical discomfort. After many D-class were sent in, the Foundation developed a basic understanding of the forest, but another breach occurred after the first successful exploratory mission finished. The individual was allowed to write down an account of his experiences, but when personnel went to check on him, they found no trace of him, and the SCP documentation says... Traces of soil and human tissue were later found in the pencil, paper, and Harvey Mansfield desk desk had used in his writing. Oh god. Other containment breaches feature similar oddities in their word and name usage, such as mentioning an agent Mercy 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 Mercy, who encountered a native entity seated atop a throne of bones, cradling a flaming child who vomited most of his bones after describing said entity. Another woman who had found a book discussing the forest complained that her head had become covered in flesh, and decades after she died, photos were taken of a native entity that resembled a young version of the woman. Oh, Another breach right, occurred after an agent there? who had spent time in a house in the forest told some stories about it to a couple of his colleagues. Who had no names, and the agent became fused with the house after it suddenly appeared in one of the Foundation sites, with the man's two colleagues conjoined to his uvula. Ooh. In other words, some massively strange stuff occurs whenever these specific rules are broken in relation to SCP-4000, whether in the forest or not. We're then given a long list of instructions that must be utilized when exploring the forest and interacting with the native entities. He said the forest is over. There's far too many here for me to go over all of them, but I'll mention a few. No firearms are ever to be brought into the forest. Native entities are to be greeted formally and spoken to cordially. No statements that an individual knows to be false are to be said. Never refer to an entity with a title, name, or designation, even if it refers to itself with one. Additionally, no names, nicknames, code names, or other personal designations are ever to be mentioned in the presence of a native entity. And if a native entity makes a statement where it addresses you with the designation, you are to ignore it as if the statement wasn't even said. So does that mean that, wait, so if I am, can I refer to someone as you? Have you seen my dog? Will that be a problem? I guess if I say you multiple times though, that will be assumed as a name, if you will. But it's interesting, dude, so some of the people actually get dragged back to the forest in some format, right? With as, as the woman that uh, died years earlier after finding it in a book, 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 uh, sorry. Then later on appeared in an image of the forest. That is really cool. But man, that's gonna be difficult though. Imagine meeting creatures there, right? And they're like, ah, Sir Adam. And you're like, oh, uh, sorry, my name is not Adam. What will happen then? You said Adam, that's a name, but does that... Will that fuck you up? Are you supposed to... And you're just supposed to be like, ignore it, like nothing happened. Wait, so... That's impossible, isn't it? I guess you continuously have to... To... Make up descriptive words of the character of which you're speaking to. So it's not designated a name by rule. But that makes it very complicated to have a, just a conversation. Like, could you imagine having to, like, continuously change up your vocabulary, vo blah, continuously change up your vocabulary just to have a conversation? Vocabulary. Dude, I said that shit like cutlery, though. I wonder if they tested my hypothesis, though, that if they say the same name, they will have the same effect. It's no guarantees, of course. It might be, I'm, I'm thinking like, if that's the case, well, how nuanced can it be? If I say Adam, 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 will they have different meanings, different effects, different things that will happen because of the, the way I say it? Or is it random if I say Adam, 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 Adam? I don't know if I correctly laid out my idea in a, in a very well-mannered way, but I th hopefully you'll understand what I mean. I mean, I've always been a little bit Pepega, so, you know, it's nothing, nothing new. Overall, the rules tell you to be very cordial to native entities, and occasionally helpful. 
but very specific with what words are used in conversation. Additional rules apply depending on what type of child you are, just like entering the forest, with oldest children never accepting or handling anything that would be considered a valuable resource. Middle children must avoid any entity that regard them affectionately or romantically, and youngest or only children must avoid partaking in any activity that is commonly considered frivolous or physically comforting, such as dancing, listening to music, or sleeping on a padded surface. Finally, we're given three interview logs between a doctor and a native entity, possessing a humanoid form and the head of a rabbit, who is given no name in the logs. These interactions are mostly notable for Ooh. showcasing the various rules that the doctor breaks during their conversations. In their first encounter, the entity asks the doctor how his name is, remarking that its own name has smelt of raspberries, or snapdragons lately, although it's hard to tell these days. The doctor makes the mistake of saying that his name has tasted rather tart of late, and was later reprimanded for breaking the rule of making a statement you know to be false. Hmm. Three years later, the doctor has another encounter with the entity, who remarks that his name has been separated from him for some time, and ponders if the name still exists at all. After the doctor tells him how he got to the forest, the entity says that he thought all of their old allies had died out, and wondered if the doctor had a grandfather or other relation that had a lover in the forest. The doctor made his first big mistake when the entity addressed him as fellow scholar, in a statement that the doctor didn't ignore. Five years later, the doctor encountered the entity for a third time, and this is where things really go wrong. Okay, okay. The doctor meets the entity at its home and is invited inside. Here, the entity reveals a story about the past, saying that very few in the forest remember it now, but it was born on the other side of the well, and hopes to someday return there. It goes on to say that there was a time when they lived and fought alongside humans, to a degree, and went to war against the factory with humans. Ooh. Then they were betrayed, and humanity wiped them out, taking most of their lives and all of their names. It's a fairy! Some, however, managed to retreat to this forest dimension, which became less of a home and more of a bunker against genocide. Here, the remaining entities live, without names, hoping to re-enter the world of humanity. It's at this point that a sudden change comes over the doctor, saying that it's time he took his leave, and that he's long overdue to return home. The rabbit entity suddenly seems confused, slurring his speech and clutching his head, asking the doctor not to go and wondering what happened to his name. The doctor leaves mentioning out loud that something does taste rather tart, and later went missing after returning to the Foundation site. Analysis of the fur he shed on his expedition gear showed no genetic abnormalities. So, you have most of the facts now, but you might still want or need an explanation. As you might have pieced together already, the entities existing in the forest are the fairies that the O5 mentioned in his tale about the factory. Yeah. Although he had claimed that they had committed genocide, completely killing off their race, it seems that he was mistaken, and some managed to escape. Somehow, in a way that isn't clearly understood, the fairies lost all of their names in the process, even the ones that managed to escape. Names have power to the fairies, both their own as well as others and they can use names to interact with our world. Assigning the forest, or any of its denizens, a name is dangerous enough. But the true danger here is their ability to steal our names. This is ultimately what happened to the Doctor, as well as a few of the notable containment breaches. Oh. During his conversation with the rabbit entity, the entity refers to the Doctor as a fellow scholar, and rather than ignoring it, he later uses it himself in the conversation. The doctor had accepted a designation from the entity, 
and that gave it power over him. In the end, the rabbit and the doctor swapped names, and since the fairies treat names as completely linked to an identity, they effectively swapped their identities as well. The doctor was now, and always was, a fairy without a name, and the rabbit was a doctor working for the SCP Foundation, thus why no one questioned the fur found on his gear. In the containment breach where the explorer oh! had written down his account at a desk and suddenly disappeared, a similar thing occurred. These fairies aren't just humanoid entities, and can take many non-biological forms. The desk, paper, and pencil where the writing had occurred fused with the explorer after he wrote about the forest on it, leaving him to a fate of being a desk. The agent who encountered the hellish entity on top of the throne of bones met a similar fate as he screamed out, Mercy, 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 mercy effectively giving the entity a name. The other cases involving the young woman and the man merging with a house showcase the same point, that the fairies can steal our names to infiltrate our world. These cases somewhat differ, however, in that instead of a fairy giving a name to a human who accepts it, like the doctor, these are humans giving names to fairies. Ideally, the Foundation would be able to effectively contain this threat using their current containment protocols. So it goes both ways. But, as the rabbit discussed, the fairies were not without their human sympathizers, and all it would take is one major breach to cause massive issues. SCP-4000 is a very interesting article, as it really combines two different stories into one impressive SCP. Mm -hmm. The Factory 001 proposal is a popular one, but it didn't really require anything else to be added onto it. The idea of a weird forest realm where entities can steal your name is interesting enough by itself, but sure. combining it with the Factory tale makes something very unique. If that wasn't enough, there's also another connection made in SCP-4000 when the rabbit entity is discussing wars. Ooh. So, so it actually kind of works both ways then. It's kind of like if you give someone a name or you get a name from someone else, then you sort of change identities. But does that mean that the, the, the researcher that was sent out is now a rabbit? Or like a, a fairy with a rabbit head? Is that the case or no? The one thing I don't, I don't really understand with the names when it comes to the fairies when the fairies try to give you a name, is it ill intent? Are they trying to take your your body, your identity, your name? Is that what they're trying to do? Or is it just kind of... Ah, you look like a scholar. How are you doing, scholar? Is it sort of, is it sort of like that? For that? That's the one thing I don't get. I'm not sure if, the, if it's ill intent... Ill, I'm not sure if it's ill intent or if it's like... They just want to return back to the other side of the well. To our world, if you will. I would nearly think about it as out of desperation. You know, imagine that you're trapped in a forest, you don't have a name, you don't have anything really, and you're trapped in a world, but you know you're from another world. You would pretty much, you would do a lot to get back to the original world where you came from, wouldn't you? I think I certainly would. So to some degree, I'm like, maybe it's just out of sheer desperation why they're trying to give others names to so they can return. But I don't know. It's, I guess it's too loosely told to make any clear distinction, I suppose. It wasn't it a little bit strange? The two times the doctor said or did like wrong things, nothing happened, right? At least they, they didn't tell us that anything happened. But the third time something happened, does that mean that it's not always things happen? Like if I, if I tell a statement that isn't true, is it a chance that there's no effects? Or is it like a buildup or like, how does that work? Cause I would think they had, it would have some effect on him. But I'm, I'm not sure. The SCP article includes a link to SCP-2932, Titania's Prison, which was a prison built by creatures for the enemies of the SCP-1000 civilization, the Children SCP of the Night. SCP-1000? The prison logs include a number of different prisoners, but the final one was meant to be kept there forever, 
with a note saying that humans were not the first to overthrow those who came before them. The prisoner's name is listed Ooh. as Fay, meaning a fairy. I highly recommend going through the SCP-4000 article yourself after watching this video to give you the full picture of the forest and the fairies. After 4,000 entries in the SCP universe, some might think that people would eventually run out of new, creative articles, but SCP authors continue to impress me. Genocide of an anomalous race is not exactly a new concept for the SCP Foundation in addition to the idea of the race making a comeback. But the fairies presented here are certainly something different. Hell yeah, dude! Let's go! That was good. SCP-1000? That's the first mention I've heard of that. So wait, does that mean that there was a race before the fairies that the fairies overthrew? Fascinating stuff. That was a great video. Holy cannoli, dude. Jen, yeah, I hope you guys did too. This was awesome. It was rather unique. Very flavorful, very creative, a lot of anomalous aspects. Uh, I love that it tied in the fairies, the factory, into this SCP. And I can also see why people really wanted me to watch the factory first. Yes, of course, he explains the factory, but in very low resolution. Like, the detailing is very minuscule at best. So I do appreciate the people recommending me watching the factory first. I sincerely appreciate that because it makes a lot more sense now we because now I have a lot of better picture of the of the factory although I may have fucked up in understanding that I thought the fairies was just chilling you know and then the because I thought I thought they men mentioned in the um, during the factory reaction video we did I thought the, the author mentioned that the foundation of the people occupying the factory got paid for uh, by wealthy people to hunt down the fairies, but um, apparently the fairies came in and tried to take over the factory because they wanted to destroy it. And the foundation was kind of just in the way. So that's that's kind of how it worked out. My bad for that misunderstanding. Uh, it is what it is. Next up, we are going to watch uh, The Serpent's Hand. Unless, of course, there is something I have to watch before The Serpent's Hand, uh, of which I will listen to the comment section and um, go through with that. But I think the next one up is The Serpent's Hand uh, by the Exploring Series. It's a 13 minute video, so it's gonna be very short. I might even be able to react to it today. Thank you guys, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.